Hello, and welcome to the Semiconductor Industry Association's public webinar series, where we address current issues impacting the global semiconductor industry and market. My name is Falan Yanug, and I am the Director for Industry Statistics and Economic Policy at SIA, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Memory semiconductors. Memory semiconductors are a foundational and important subsegment of the semiconductor market. Indeed, memory chips are required in virtually all electronic products. According to the World Semiconductor Trade Statistics Program, in 2020, global sales of memory tied for the largest single share of any subproduct at 27% of the total market. But memory is not just one single monolithic product. There are various types of memory technologies, such as DRAM, NAND, and NOR flash, and SRAM, that help enable a variety of end use technologies in different ways, as well as next generation memory products in development. Here to help us make sense of current and future trends in the memory market, as well as emerging advances in memory technology are three distinguished panelists. Mr. Craig Stice is Chief Analyst at Omdia. As part of the memory research team at Omdia, Craig focuses on the worldwide NAND industry. Craig's research provides detailed analysis of NAND manu manufacturing, technology trends, as well as application demand drivers to create an overall view of the current NAND supply demand environment and the outlook. Craig began his career as an industry analyst with IHS Market, now Omdia, in 2012. And prior to that, Craig spent 16 years at Micron Technology working in product marketing and business development. Welcome, Craig. Mr. Reiner Huller is Vice President and GM of Flash Solutions at Infineon Technologies. Reiner led the integration of the former expansion memory business into Cypress and later into Infineon, establishing leadership in NOR solutions for high performance, high reliability, and high density NOR business in applications where failure is really not an option. During his more than 20 years in the memory industry, Dr. Huller developed and managed various semiconductor memory businesses across different memory types, such as DRAM, ferroelectric RAM, non-volatile SRAM, NAND flash, and NOR flash. Welcome, Reiner. Finally, Dr. Thomas Boone is Vice President of Defense and Aerospace at Spin Memory Incorporated. Tom joined Spin Memory in 2014 and has held director level positions in nanofabrication, photolithography, test and reliability before transitioning to his current role in managing the company's high rel product business for military and space applications. Currently, his team is developing strategic rad hard memory products for the US Department of Defense and space industry. Before joining Spin Memory, Tom was a lead technologist for the optoelectronic development of heat assisted magnetic recording at HGST, a Western digital company. Earlier in his career, Tom was a research staff member at Hitachi Global Storage Technologies, where his contributions resulted in three separate world record recording aerial density demonstrations for hard disk drive technology. He has also over 25 patents and 30 peer reviewed journal articles. Welcome, Tom. So we are fortunate to have a group of panelists who have experience working in different parts of the memory sector. Craig, you worked for 16 years for one of the world's leading suppliers of DRAM and NAND flash, Micron Technology. Reiner, Infineon is involved in producing other equally important types of memory solutions. And Tom, you're working at Spin Memory on emerging memory technologies. Craig, why don't we start with you? Help us understand the big picture when it comes to the memory market, where we are, uh, where we're going, and also in terms of technologies, and in particular in the DRAM and NAND flash space. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to uh, be here today. Let me share my screen, bring my slides up. <clears throat> okay. Again, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the time today. I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, main memory, DRAM and NAND flash. How big it is, what does it do? Well, if you don't really know too much about mainstream high volume memory, DRAM and NAND flash, well, they are about everywhere uh, in any kind of electronic system. Uh, if you look, for example, at things you might really understand, a PC, a server, a smartphone, uh, you'll find DRAM and NAND inside of these systems. Uh, what do they do? Well, 
DRAM essentially in the simplest form, it helps to manage your data. It does require power to operate while NAND stores your data, but does not require power. It's non-volatile versus volatile. But I said, as I said, it is just about in every type of electronic out there, some form of memory uh, you will find within. Uh, but if you really just look at those three big markets I just mentioned, the enterprise market, uh, which you could center as servers, hyperscale data centers, uh, the PC market and the mobile market, those three markets alone make up approximately 80% of all DRAM and NAND demand. So those three markets alone obviously are, are uh, extremely important and do uh, move the market one way or the other. The other 20%, well, it's vast. Uh, it could be TVs, game consoles, removable storage cards, the automotive markets, of course, all sorts of different consumer electronic products, industrial, medical applications, military, aerospace, you can go on and on and on. Again, about every um, kind of electronic system out there will have some sort of memory in it, typically. So how big is this mainstream memory? How big is DRAM and NAND? Well, in 2020, we estimate that these two markets alone combined reached about $120 billion in revenue. Comparatively, as, as Falon actually noted earlier, uh, we see the semiconductor market as a whole in 2020 reaching about 470 billion. So DRAM and NAND make up about 25%, just these high volume two memory solutions of the total worldwide semiconductor revenue. It's significant. Uh, and it does influence the market, uh, can be one way, uh, sometimes positive and sometimes unfortunately negative. But why is that? If you look back historically, DRAM and NAND are, are well understood to be cyclical. Uh, it's driven very heavily by supply and demand or really the uh, imbalances of supply and demand. If you look at the chart down below, the, the blue bar is NAND year-over-year -year revenue, where the, uh, the reddish-pink bar is DRAM, and then the, the line is the year-over-year -year percentage, uh, which kind of looks like a, a, a mountainside for some reason. Uh, but there you can see there's a lot of ups and downs. Um, if you were to go back to just recently, uh, going back to 2017 and 2018 on the chart, you'll see that both the DRAM and the NAND market uh, recorded historical revenue years in 2017 and 2018. But then typical cyc cyclical patterns in 2019, the market fell. Demand grew stagnant, uh, although bit growth was persistent, meaning that supply was still coming online. Inventory levels began to increase. And when that happens, we start to see pricing or ASPs fall as the manufacturers try to uh, reduce their inventory levels. In the memory industry, what usually goes up comes back down, but then also can go back up again. In 2020, the market went back up, even during a worldwide pandemic. Uh, what we learned, uh, quite frankly, in 2020 was it takes a lot of infrastructure to support work from home, educate from home, and even entertain from home environments. As we look ahead, we expect these cycles will continue. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's hard to predict when they're going to happen or how big a spike might be or how low a fall might be, but we will expect them to happen at some point in the future. I talked a little bit about 2020, but let's, let's take a little closer look because uh, it was certainly an interesting year, of course, uh, with COVID-19 and the pandemic. As I mentioned, 2019 was a disastrous year for the memory industry. Uh, the worst year over year decline in revenue uh, on record. Um, it was already expected 2020 was going to be a rebound year. And in fact, we came out of 2019 already seeing good positive momentum. Uh, and then COVID hit. And no one really knew what to expect. Uh, certainly were scares of would there be production shutdowns. Uh, logistical issues, who's going to drive the trucks, who's going to fly the planes, um, would demand go stagnant because of all of these stay at home uh, mandates that were taking place around the world. There are a lot of unknowns, more questions than answers. And in fact, the smartphone market took the biggest hit early on last year in 2020. In fact, uh, our research team at Omdia early in the year 
uh, took out 200 million, 200 million smartphones for the forecast from the forecast in 2020. And uh, 2020 was going to be a big year for 5G launch. So it was a, it was a significant uh, change in the forecast because of COVID-19. But things, uh, things changed soon. Data center demand erupted because of all of the at-home uh, data that was being generated. PC markets flourished. Corporate consumer educational markets were upgrading their PCs for at-home use. The at-home entertainment market spiked, TV sales spiked, gaming. Uh, you could also even go and say TV streaming, movie streaming. People are at home. They needed things to do at home. All of this activity requires memory. In the first half of the year last year, pricing went up. It was a very, very strong year. There was not enough product to meet all of this sudden demand. By the second half of last year, the dust settled a little bit. The mobile markets were bouncing back. Uh, the 5G market was starting to come online. Uh, there was a little bit different of a change of strategy. We were seeing more low-end, mid-tier priced 5G phones come into the market to help incite demand. PCs uh, were outperforming continuously where he was still seeing good, strong demand from corporate, consumer, and educational. But the enterprise markets started to go soft. They had collected inventory at those end markets. They went through a phase of inventory management. And to be honest, we are still in that phase today. So in the second half of the year, pricing Demand slowed, pricing started to fall. Again, the ups and the downs of the memory cycle. A Little bit closer look at demand. This time we'll look ahead. I'll start at the bottom actually on this, on this table because as I mentioned, the PC server and mobile markets make up roughly 80% of demand. So in the near term, in the PC world, as I said, we are still seeing strong demand, steady demand. It's very unseasonal for this time of the year. Now, a lot of this demand is coming from uh, educational, Chromebook, for example, uh, which typically have lower memory content. So even though demand is still very strong, not as big of an influence on all of the memory markets. We're cautioning ourselves for the second half of this year on this PC market um, with our fingers crossed and hopefully vaccinations can get out into the world Students can get back into the classroom. People can get back into the business offices. Some amount of normalcy can resume. Uh, will there be a softening in this market uh, because of that? So that's something that we're going to watch. Doesn't mean the market's going to go uh, away anytime soon. We expect there to continue to be stability in the notebook markets in the next couple of years. And even in the longer term, with all of this demand we've had in the last year, will we see a... Um, an upgrade cycle, a replacement cycle begin to take place in those years to come. Server markets, as I mentioned, it's been soft, but we expect that market to return in the first half of this year. Uh, we haven't seen great signs of that yet, but uh, we do fully expect that to be coming, which will certainly help uh, on the demand side of things. We don't expect it to be as big as last year. Of course, last year was uh, 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 nothing we could uh, put on record as is something that we've ever seen before, um, but we do expect it to be strong. Again, looking ahead, uh, the next generation of DRAM, DDR5, will be coming online in the next couple of years. Markets such as edge, edge server, servers and edge computing, artificial intelligence, as that momentum gains and becomes stronger, all of that requires memory solutions. Uh, and, and for NAND flash, uh, HDD, cold storage, where we store our photos, our movies out in, in the cloud in the data center, uh, we could start to see SSD replace those cold storage. We're still years out from that, but long term. Smartphone markets, certainly we expect the smartphone market uh, to recover. We are seeing that uh, it is expected to be a big year for 5G. Uh, not only just in the high end, but as I mentioned, in the low end and in the low tier to meet all of the different economical ranges uh, in the smartphone market. We will start to see saturation in, in the years to come. So that market will start to slow, but we will get replacement cycles and content, memory content within the smartphone will continue to grow uh, in content, which will help 
to continue demand. Graphics, consumer, just a couple of the other smaller markets. Um, again, game consoles. We just had two launches from the two big game consoles uh, at the end of last year, which has helped because they have moved into SSD, which is NAND flash based. Uh, cryptocurrency mining is coming back and that does drive demand as well. We expect these cycles to continue in the gaming, although in the gaming world, they are very cyclical. New systems don't launch until about every four years and are very cyclical in seasonal demand as well around the holidays, Christmas time. Consumer markets, we will always continue to see new consumer products. The IoT, uh, the big buzzwords that you could think of will all continue to drive demand, not only in the near term, but as far out as we could see in the long term. The next couple slides, I wanna talk a little bit about manufacturing and who is manufacturing these technologies. Start with DRAM. When we go back in time and even up to today, decades, DRAM goes through what we would call a die shrink. Well, we're basically the, the XY printed pattern on the wafer of the DRAM cell structure gets smaller and smaller with each next generation process node. Along with that, we get architectural changes within these new generations. As we go through these, not only does the die get smaller itself, but we also typically get higher capacities, faster speeds, lower power, overall better performance. Uh, to the end market, that's good because then they can design their end products to take advantage of these new performances and better performances from memory. Um, to the manufacturers, smaller die means more bits per wafer, a better cost structure per wafer. So they are very critical in the memory world to go through these generational changes and die shrinks. Today, after decades of die shrinks, uh, we are reaching extremely small patterns. Um, these cycles have slowed uh, because as we continue to go through these die changes, they are getting more and more difficult to do. Uh, they are becoming more expensive to do. As we get closer to 10 nanometer DRAM manufacturing, EUV, ultraviolet, uh, is going to be uh, a necessary tool to continue lithography in the future. With all of that, the manufacturers don't see as big of a cost savings as they used to. Um, so as we move forward, these changes get more timely, uh, spread out, um, and, and, and again, we don't see as much of a change as, as we go forward. Who's making them? Well, in the DRAM world, there are basically three main DRAM manufacturers, uh, Samsung, SK Hynix, and Micron Technology. These three make up about 95% of worldwide DRAM revenue. Now, if you compare that to 2008, those same, same three companies only made up about 60%. There were a lot more players in the DRAM world back then. This market was very competitive, very volatile, Ultimately, M&A uh, took place, leaving just these three uh, major manufacturers left. But with these three major manufacturers and with production uh, being more challenging and these um, die shrinks being uh, taking longer to get, DRM output is actually a bit more stable than it ever once was before. Of course, we're all watching China. Uh, in China, there is CXMT, uh, a new DRAM manufacturer that is starting up. Uh, it is an extremely challenging market to just come in Greenfield and be a technology leading edge. So they are behind in terms of technology, but they are growing uh, and do have plans to get into mainstream and caught up with technology. Uh, so they will be somebody to watch, somebody to watch uh, in the future as they continue to grow and improve their technology. NAND, uh, similarly, uh, years ago, NAND went through die shrinks, shrinking the chip itself. But in about 2017, the, the NAND industry really hit a, a roadblock and had shrunk as far as they could go. So NAND went vertical, went to what we call from 2D NAND to 3D NAND. Uh, think of it as a single story home going to a high rise apartment. You have the same footprint, but now more capacity. So all these vertical layers on the NAND all create 
uh, higher capacities, more bits per wafer, and ultimately a better cost structure to do so. So today the world is on a 96 layer, so 96 layers uh, on top of each other, moving to 128 layers-ish. Uh, every vendor has a uh, somewhat subset of, of that layer count. To date, we really don't have an end, how high we can stack. Uh, at some point, we'll be, soon we'll be stacking stacks on top of stacks uh, to continue this trend. But as we continue to add these layer, manufacturing gets more challenging. It's a lot of points to try to connect together uh, to keep yields, uh, in a high production uh, manufacturing type of environment. Who's making NAND? Well, the same three players, Samsung SK Hynix also manufacture NAND. A little bit less, they only manufacture about 70, 67 of worldwide NAND revenue. Uh, the rest, there's Kioxia, which you might know as uh, Toshiba Memory, uh, and Western Digital. They have a partnership together but if you were combined their manufacturing output today would certainly rival Samsung, uh, who is the leader in the industry. Intel has their own NAND manufacturing division, but you might be aware that uh, recently they announced SK Hynix will be acquiring their fab in Dalian, China uh, over the next end of this year, then over the years to come. And then again, in China, we're watching YMTC. They are a new company uh, out of Wuhan, China, uh, doing very well. They are, uh, again, a brand new greenfield company, uh, but they've been able to at least been it to uh, get caught up fairly quickly with technology. Not a big manufacturer in terms of market share yet, but uh, again, somebody we are watching in the years ahead. Quick summary, DRAM and NAND is big, 100 billion plus dollar industry but it's very cyclical. It goes up and it goes down dramatically at times, but it does make up about 25% uh, of the total semiconductor industry. So it's extremely influential. PCs, mobile enterprise make up the vast majority of all of NAND and DRAM, uh, but it is everywhere uh, in any other kind of electronics. Die shrinks, uh, whether it's on DRAM is becoming more difficult, more challenging, but it's becoming more stable in terms of supply. NAND has gone vertical in its layer counts uh, and will continue to add layer counts in the years to come to continue to add more bits per wafer. Um, again, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your time, but from here, I'm going to uh, hand it off to my, uh, my next colleague, uh, that will be uh, give you a little bit more information. Thank you, uh, Craig. No, this has been a very helpful overview. I appreciate all the helpful information, um, and especially focusing on, on NAND and DRAM. Um, but we all know NAND and DRAM is not all, and um, hope, I'm glad we also have uh, from Infineon Technologies, Reiner, uh, to tell us about some of the other important technologies uh, and types of uh, memory that are in, in the works. Um, Reiner, tell us about your world in memory. Okay, first, uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so thank you, Falan, and thank you, uh, Craig, for the overview. So I'm switching gears a little bit here, and I'm going to talk about memory solutions when failure is not an option. Uh, that's what we do at Infineon. So think about it. If you want to have a memory which is responsible for the safety of your car driving itself, or if you want to have a memory for the mobile infrastructure, or if you're in an industrial environment, where a failure could move a, a big heavy machine, or if you have medical equipment, sometimes implantables, if you wanna have a memory in a system which is inside your body, what type of memory do you need? What type of features do you need? Uh, these are the questions we ask ourselves and these are the questions we address with our memories. One slide briefly about Infineon. Infineon acquired Cyprus somewhat less than a year ago, and that brought Infineon a big step forward on the vision to have the position to bring complete solutions um, to link the real world with the digital world. Uh, what do I mean with that? So first, um, Infineon had a very strong portfolio uh, for a long time already when it comes to power electronics, or when it comes to um, electronics and sensors on, on the real world, driving the sensing as well as the actuating of, of the real world. 
With the acquisition of Cyprus, the already existing portfolio of Infineon got much stronger when it comes to the computing, the local, local computing with microcontrollers and the memory solutions. And then when you look here on the right side of the slide, we have also now a much better setup of all the connectivity solutions on how we can connect these local embedded solutions to the internet, uh, to the cloud. Now, the memories we are doing are actually very different in their requirements from what Craig described as the mass mainstream memories, which are mainly used in compute servers, mobiles, uh, smartphones, and, and PCs. We're working in, in, in the world which is in much harsher environments and has a much bigger diversity of requirements. But there are a few requirements which are very common. First and absolute foremost is it needs to be reliable. In many cases, we need performance for specific use cases, which is better than the mainstream. And in some cases, we are battery operated in very tough environments uh, where the reliability needs to be secured, but at the same time, you have a very low power budget. And then finally, since these systems are out in the world, you often can't control the physical environment where they are located. So they are connected and therefore you have to secure them against cyber attacks. You can't physically secure them. Now think about it again, if you have a car, reliability is key. You can't have a blue screen in your ADA system for the car responsible for your safety when you're cruising on the highway. Uh, communication systems must work under all conditions, all weather conditions, as well as they need to work remotely uh, with highest reliability. An industrial robot needs to be secured that if there's a power glitch, for an example, that when it comes back, that it's not in an uncontrolled state, but you know exactly where the robot is and avoid that it does uh, dangerous movements. And then when it comes to wearables, and especially when it comes to medical wearables or even implantables, you, you have battery operated, which need to work for years inside your body uh, on a very low battery uh, power budget. This is just one page which gives you a rough idea on the diversity of applications. Again, I'm showing here automotive, industrial, medical, also aerospace, defense, and communications. And I'm not going to go here into the details of all these applications, but I think you get quickly an idea that the diversity of use cases requires a diversity of technologies. In many cases over the years, because the mainstream memories were so established, um, it was still mainly tried to use uh, the standard memory technologies were, which were optimized for PCs or optimized for smartphones in these applications. But we realize more and more as the requirements towards these applications are growing, that one size fit all it is just not cutting it. You need different solutions for these different applications. So therefore, we, we developed over the last 35 years a number of technologies and products. And that goes back to a number of companies. Uh, the NorFlash originally goes back to, to AMD, then Spansion, uh, Siphon came into play, Ramtron on the FRAM side, Cypress, and now Infineon. So there is now a very unique, I think, portfolio available at Infineon for different technologies addressing different use cases. Starting with our newest Semper NOR flash, this is uh, the newest generation of high performance NOR flash, which has integrated functional safety and security. Um, it even has an integrated compute core, and I will talk a little bit more about what you can do with that. If you, on the other side, look at our newest ferroelectric RAM products called Exelon, these are products which are extremely good if you want to do data logging of very critical data. The nice thing and the unique thing about FRAM is it has a very, very fast write. As soon as you have given the command to write something, you can be sure that the data is secured, even if the power goes away within nanoseconds. At the same time, you have basically an unlimited endurance. So you can rewrite the content pretty much as often as you like, uh, more like a DRAM. 
So this is very good for critical data logging. We have our workhouse technologies on the serial and parallel NOR flash. These are more reliable uh, compared to NAND flash. They are also uh, better when you have random access and we deliver various low power modes specifically for, for the use cases of these memories. Then Cypress was the, the market leader and now Infineon is the market leader in SRAM. A much smaller market by now, but still uh, plays a very important role in special applications. It, it combines the very high performance with very low uh, power modes. And at the same time, uh, we have developed it radiation hardened such that you can use these memories, for example, also in space, uh, where you have very strong radiation hitting the electronics all the time, and normal electronics would, would die out where SRAM is still operating solidly. We then combine these technologies in things like non-volatile SRAM, which combines the performance of an SRAM with a non-volatility that when the power goes off, uh, the, the, the content is automatically stored in a flash cell directly next to each SRAM cell. And then when the power comes back, you can restart at exactly the state uh, where you lost power. And then finally, we also introduced Hyper RAM. This is actually a, a pseudo SRAM DRAM uh, based technology, uh, which allows to do some um, scratch pad memory or extension memory to microcontrollers when the internal RAM is running out of space, but you don't want to run a full-blown DRAM on, on top of that, and you can share a very efficient bus with your NOR flash. So you can have a very efficient uh, memory subset in your edge nodes at the microcontrollers. Of course, that needs to be supported in a different way when it comes to longevity of supply. Um, all of that has to fulfill various standards in the automotive and in, in the industrial world. Now, this is just one example about our Semper Secure. So you're starting with a high-performance NORFLASH state-of-the-art, as it is shown here, with high-performance interfaces and a modern um, array. And then we did a very fundamental and unique step by implementing an ARM core, a compute core, inside the chip. We were able to do that cost-efficiently. The majority of the die is still the, the array. But now we have a completely different level of opportunities to scale and to uh, implement more features. So the first step we did, which we call the Semper family, we improved the reliability further by having a more active memory management inside the chip. And then we added functional safety features, which allow to diagnose the chip to make sure that uh, boot processes are clean in an environment like a car where the power may not be as stable as you always would like. And you can correct errors, not on, inside only the, the array, but also during the communication with so-called CRC effects. Now, as this modular um, architecture is also more scalable, in the next generation, we went another major step forward and implemented a slew of security features you would only find otherwise on very high-end secure microcontrollers. We added both hardware as well as firmware inside the chip, which now allow to have that chip as a root of trust, as well as having everything encrypted and therefore highly secured against cyber attacks. So what you get now is a most advanced secured NOR flash in combination with functional safety required in automotive and industrial applications. And we support that with a solution kit because this is now more like a memory subsystem and it's um, uh, a little, uh, it has so many options that um, um, you put that into your development system to maximize what you wanna use in your use case. So that memory subsystem can be now used with a development kit in your development environment. So that gives you an idea how far we have gone from a standard memory NOR flash you had, say, five years ago, now to a modern NOR-based subsystem in embedded systems. So in conclusion, I'd like to really give you three main, main topics. First, 
the electronics is becoming pervasive in the world. It's everywhere. The real world is getting smarter and smarter. It's not just in the data center or in the computers anymore. And at the same time, it's in critical uh, systems. Uh, our lives depend more and more on it. Uh, think about the, the, the infrastructure and what we just saw in Texas if an infrastructure fails. The applications are diversifying. Um, there is not that one major architecture which is usually uh, used in, in PCs. Uh, even there, we see more more diversity now, but in, in these types of applications, the diversity is tremendous and different technologies and solutions are required to address them. And then dependability is key. That goes hand in hand with the number one. Everything is connected. So we need to have on the one side, the absolute uh, capability to keep the systems running under all conditions, but at the same time as they are connected, we have to secure them against cyber attacks. And that has to go inside the memory. Um, the memory stores the boot code, the, basically the root of all your system information on how it is operating. If you could crack into that, uh, you have no chance to, to solve the cybersecurity purely with software afterwards. So with these three, um, I thank you for your attention. Check us out also at Embedded World and looking forward to your questions later. Thank you, Reiner. You know, I really uh, identify with the underscore theme of uh, reliability for chips. Um, someone who just bought a car, uh, I can't imagine my ADAS system automatically sort of going out on me or blue screen turning up. You know how much I rely on on these these technologies. Uh, you know, in in my in, in my car that I that, that we just bought. So, yeah, completely completely makes sense. Um, uh, Tom, um, you know, we're so we're fortunate to have Spin Memory here uh, as a company that operates in sort of the emerging um, emerging memory technology space. So um, can you tell us about what kind of work that you folks are doing in, the, in memory? Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Fallon and SIA for uh, including spin memory in this very inter interesting and important uh, conversation. So uh, just to give you some background, spin memory is a uh, Silicon Valley startup. Uh, we have support from, uh, from Allied Mines, uh, from investment and from Allied Mines, as well as support uh, and commercial partnerships with Applied Materials and NARM. Uh, we've been in business since 2012, and our key focus is on developing MRAM technology uh, to, uh, in, in manufacturing and product development and uh, for uh, non-volatile and uh, SRAM-like replacement uh, in the future. Uh, we're relatively a vertically integrated company uh, for a small team. We actually have uh, design, magnetic physics. Uh, we have our own characterization and test support, plus. Uh, to show our commitment, we actually invested in a uh, back into the line, uh, CMOS, essentially CMOS agnostic, uh, back in the line clean room uh, and, and, and factory in Fremont. Um, so we're somewhat bringing the, the silicon back to Silicon Valley. Um, and as you could tell from my title, uh, we're, our, one of my primary focuses right now is in the, uh, uh, the space for uh, strategic and defense applications. Um, just to give you a quick snapshot of where we stand with, with MRAM at this point, we actually are focused on perpendicular spin transfer torque magneto resistive uh, 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 random access memory, which is a mouthful. Uh, but each of those are actually important. And essentially we're a part of this, what I like to call the, the, the SENSAMP family of, of emerging memories. Uh, we're all in this uh, resistive space. Uh, so the alphabet soup of RAM phase change, CRAM, uh, but in, in particular, our focus is on storing the, uh, the, the data in a resistive state for the device. And so here you can see in this image, essentially all the, the, the critical memory is stored in a, in a small uh, one nanometer thick layer uh, called a, the free layer, which is, has this magnetic polarization either pointing up or pointing down. And uh, based on that orientation, you're either storing the, the, the data in a one or zero state based on the resistance of this two terminal device. And so the you can actually see that the anatomy of the device is a, a reference uh, layer metal that has this magnetic orientation and one orientation is always pinned in that orientation, while the free layer is written into the, the, up, the up state or the down state, which has an impact on that resistance. Um, the reason this is so interesting for the, the markets that we're targeting in the, the space and defense community is 
since I mentioned this is uh, the, the fundamental element is a, uh, a metallic device that's been integrated into a CMOS uh, circuit, uh, being a metal, it is very uh, um, uh, immune to radiation from either high energy photons or from uh, uh, high energy particles that you would normally in a semiconductor uh, generate much, uh, a great deal of charge, which disrupts your memory. Uh, with MRAM, it being a metal, you actually have a, a couple orders of magnitude more electrons within your device. And in this case, the, the memory is stored in its uh, magnetic polarization state. So there's almost no interaction with these radiation events, which is one of the biggest challenges for, for, for Radhard microelectronics. And uh, that's, that's made this a very attractive device for these applications. Now, uh, spin memory also happens to have the benefits of being located in the United States and having mostly a, a US citizen team. Therefore, that does make us quite attractive uh, to certain customers that, that need to maintain a, a US base in their manufacturing uh, capabilities. Uh, the competition for this technology uh, is part of this sort of alphabet soup of, of emerging technologies that we have. First of all, there is a uh, legacy, the toggle MRAM, which has been quite successful in space. There's terabits of, of, of MRAM flying over our heads today. Um, and we'll touch on that in just a moment, what that technology is, but it's really sort of a real paradigm shift to where we are today with STT MRAM. Additionally, uh, RRAM, uh, FE RAM, several other uh, technologies are also uh, rad hard and, and, are, and are considered for these applications. However, when you could look at the performance and the stability of an MRAM bit, we think that the, those two uh, pieces will have a, a significant advantage in the future for, for these sorts of applications. Uh, just sort of if we look at the comparison charts of uh, the various technologies that you would consider for, for these sorts of applications, um, you can use sort of the uh, rad tolerant gate here at the bottom. You can see that there's really only a couple of device uh, technologies that are intrinsically rad hard. Uh, I do agree that SRAM can be rad hard by design, uh, but there's a lot of shielding typically involved and things in that, uh, and, and also some more critical design aspects versus MRAM, FE RAM, and RRAM, which are effectively essentially rad hard as a, as a bit. And therefore, when you consider that as the first gate to, to getting into these space applications, you see that MRAM really does have a lot of the speed and endurance requirements to put it sort of at the lead for these sorts of applications. And, and when we think, consider about, um, I mean, this is a good week to discuss this with the success of Perseverance and uh, the amount of rad hard microelectronics that are required in those sorts of applications and the expansion that we see in that market. Uh, we're very interested to, to capitalize on that as an early adopter of the most advanced MRAM technologies moving forward. But coming down to earth, and uh, I have three themes I'd kind of like to hit on today in terms of where we see the market going in the future. As I mentioned, uh, you know, this is a very nice uh, arena to sort of capture early adoption of, of these sorts of new technologies. But really across the board, you can see that um, there's some really high demand and needs based on the, the, the conversation that we just heard from uh, my, my colleagues. And specifically, what I'd like to focus on is uh, on the data center, on the real challenges of the data center. I, I'm sure uh, many of us remember hearing that the Pentagon is the world's largest office building. And uh, of course, the, uh, the, the, the Cowboys Stadium, I believe, was the largest uh, football stadium in the United States. Compare that to the average data center in the same scale now. This is just one of the data centers in Council Bluffs. And you can see the enormity of these data centers. And of course, uh, these are floor to ceiling with computers and up to 60% of the power is literally used to transfer data around buses in th through the memory systems. And so we see this, this natural evolution of all the embedded technologies and specifically MRAM of getting more and more memory being pulled into the chip, sort of breaking the, the von Neumann chain and actually having as much memory near the processing as possible is really being the, the one critical caveat uh, that, that, this, that we're going to be facing in terms of addressing this issue. Actually, I had a colleague who designs these facilities and he says the only thing that they look into when they're picking a site is how much electrons they can get to the facility. It's strictly a power play in terms of being able to, to, to power these, these uh, mammoth structures. And so uh, there's only so much that we can do with, uh, with, with moving data around these facilities. And so the more data that we can bring near the computation is going to be critical. And that's where these, these new technologies and these embedded memory technologies will really have uh, a major role to play in the future. Uh, second thing I'd like to hit on is the fact that it's really, as, as a community, we have to stay very fresh on the uh, variations in these technologies, just because we've heard of, for example, I can draw from my, my experience, 
Uh, MRAM is in some cases considered a 20 year old technology. As I mentioned before, the toggle MRAM uh, has been flying uh, in, in satellites, for example, for quite some time and in many high rel environments. Um, but so I'll be talking to a customer about, about MRAM. They think they know the technology and they just want more of it at lower power, but they don't recognize the amount of innovation and evolution that has gone through uh, the past 10 years and that the MRAM of, of the past really has very little to do with the MRAM of today uh, outside some of the atoms that we use in actually building the structure. And for example, here, this is on the same scale. I'm showing you the toggle MRAM you'll see this large wire underneath the device. That, that, that wire is there to actually have a current driven through it that generates an external magnetic field that actually writes the bit. Uh, there's actually the second wire going across the top that does the same thing, same thing. So the power required to flip this has to go through an electrical conversion into magnetic fields and then the magnetic field actually switches the device. Uh, this was really pretty much a, not a very multi-generational technology because of all the requirements of uh, being able to source it with these large currents. And you can see this large bit. Compare that to today's uh, perpendicular STT MRAM that we're working on. Now you see that we're getting almost a 16 bit word will fit into the same, uh, same area as a single uh, toggling bit. And so this is a, a, a very new technology, even though it has the same, the same title uh, involving uh, quite a few innovations. And now that the magnetic fields are actually standing uh, perpendicular out of the plane, which gives the devices much more efficiency. Also the size, the fact that devices are so much smaller and can be uh, directly uh, interrogated through the two terminals and written through the two terminals, the power is literally orders of magnitude less uh, than the uh, technology that we used in the, in the original MRAM. So if I can draw an analogy, it would be much like the, the, the conversion from bipolar to CMOS uh, and, and perhaps even throw a little gall gallium nitride in there in the process. So these are, these are rapidly changing technologies. This is true across the whole emerging technology space. And I think it's incumbent upon us as a, a community to really try to educate and stay fresh on what these changes are and, and what the benefits of each of their, these are going to be. Because uh, I don't think I'm too controversial to say that, you know, we're not of the opinion that, or I'm not of the opinion that Moore's law uh, is still continuing and it's probably been gone for quite some time. I believe in even the, the, the scaling that we're doing to this day is really a part of the emerging of, of new technologies, including the two and a half D and the three D that we were mentioning earlier. And uh, as these technologies evolve, I think we're going to see a very interesting uh, bifurcation of how we implement each one of these. And then the final theme I would like to touch on for that that point is the fact that we uh, do have to have a holistic approach in how we solve these problems. At Spin, for example, uh, we all like drop-in replacements and want to replace sockets as easily as possible. However, if we're really gonna capitalize on these technologies, we have to take advantage of each piece. And for example, we, we have uh, IP that we've generated to, to make the bit itself more efficient down at the magnetic level. Additionally, we uh, have used sort of the same uh, philosophy that was one done for wear leveling with flash memory to make sure that understanding the physics, we can build clever controllers that can actually in, enhance the speed and the endurance of these new technologies along with health monitors uh, to, for, for, for health of the, the system and as well as the security. And then as we start to integrate more and more into the, the standard CMOS flows, we, we have a generate IP that's gonna help us understand how to best modify the silicon as well as the uh, MRAM to get the most efficient application out of these devices. So it's a very exciting time, but it's a very challenging time. So uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the opportunity, Valen. I appreciate that, Tom. Thank you for the um, for this detailed explanation. Um, why don't we spend the next uh, ten minutes or so in the hour going through some Q and A? Um, I uh, have gotten a couple of, some questions from the audience, so please um, continue if you have a question to submit it in the Q and A button. Um, and I'll try to sort of uh, see if I can sort of summarize some of these questions and send them out to, and, and sort of pass them along. So, Craig, why don't I begin with you? I got a couple. We got a couple of questions that looking about looking about the market again. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, 2020 market, as you mentioned, very, um, very unpredictable, historically unpredictable, historically crazy, um, to just be, be, be blunt, um, trying to figure out how that went through, um, uh, going through it was, was, was crazy. Um, but one, 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 one question we have is um, trade and technology dispute between the U.S. and China 
um, uh, on memory. Um, how did, did that have any effect uh, if in, in terms of uh, uh, mem the memory market um, in uh, 2020, uh, along with uh, COVID? And also along those lines, I'll just put out there too, in terms of the, the, the market, uh, the industry side, you mentioned a couple of companies that uh, in, in the memory space that China um, uh, is uh, trying to develop their uh, DRAM and NAND um, uh, capabilities. Uh, if you could provide some sort of assessment from your point of view, how are they doing? Like, I mean, this is super, this is hard, you know, and, and, and a lot of companies have uh, dropped out over the past decades in terms of making memory and there are these last survivors. And now there's this um, effort on the part of um, uh, uh, some Chinese companies to try to get in. Um, uh, um, what's your thinking on, on both those questions? Uh, yeah, really good questions. Um, the the political interference um, that it's it still kind of has a, a cloud over everything. Uh, another one that it's 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 a challenge to try to predict. Um, I'll, I'll try to give an example, but certainly there were some um, some impacts in the memory industry on the from a mainstream perspective. And I'm, I'll, I'll use uh, um, I'll use Huawei as the example. They've kind of been in, in the spotlight with a lot of these uh, political um, uh, challenges and, and going on with the U.S. and China, um, their smartphone business uh, really saw the impact from, from all the, the tariffs and, and, and the political interference. Um, last year, when, when it was coming to front that Huawei was going to be challenged in their smartphone industry because of, of the political uh, tariffs and, and, and uh, um, restrictions that were being put in place, uh, they did go through a, a, a fairly large surge of buying inventory stock up because they knew at one point past a certain date that they would not be able to uh, procure uh, precious semiconductor material. Uh, so that surge in, in demand coming from Huawei did have a, a, a short term impact on, on memory and the supply and demand dynamics. After that, uh, there was kind of a reaction from competitors of Huawei. Uh, they were then going and purchasing inventory to prepare themselves for any new opportunities that might come their way uh, to take some of that business that Huawei may not be able to uh, secure. Uh, so both of those activities as a result of the, the politics that were being put in place, uh, you, you, you could understand how it does change the supply and demand dynamics. It's been more of a short-term scenario uh, where these buying patterns were coming in and then coming out, but we have seen that. Uh, it, these, these political interferences are new as well. Uh, you throw, a, throw in a pandemic on top of it and they're, they're really difficult to try to predict, understand what might happen next because everything might change tomorrow, as we all know. Um, so I hope that helped at least a little bit on, 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 on that question. On, on China, certainly everybody's watching China. Uh, it, it's fairly well known. China has a much larger plan to be uh, solely independent within their own semiconductor production. Um, memory being a big part of that, of course. So there is a, a big push for memory. There are big financial backings. Uh, for these uh, memory manufacturers to get up and running. And it's, it's extraordinarily challenging. On the NAND side, YMTC, um, I would say thus far, they are meeting expectations. Uh, from a technology side, um, they are currently a, a layer count approximately behind, but they have plans to skip a layer count, uh, jump from 64 layer to 128 layer, uh, within this coming year. So when they do that, when they land on 128 layer, they will essentially be uh, caught up more or less with the rest of the industry. From a capacity wafer output, um, they still don't have a, as big of an impact uh, towards the, uh, the worldwide industry, but of course they are growing. They are still expanding their fab in Wuhan uh, with other fabs planned down the road as well too, to continue to grow and be a much bigger piece of the marketplace. Um, when we look at DRAM, CXMT, DRAM technology is actually uh, more challenging than NAND, and not to dismiss NAND technology, but DRAM is challenging. Uh, so they have come in um, with a, a technology. They are still a couple of process nodes behind the rest of the industry, um, but they are making up ground. Their actual output 
uh, is still relatively small in comparison to the rest of the industry. So they haven't made a big impact yet. Uh, but of course, everybody's watching them uh, and uh, we'll be uh, monitoring as they grow and you know how they are able to succeed and execute on, on their plans going forward. Appreciate that, Craig. Yeah, I'm sure you'll yeah. be keeping keep, keep, keep an eye on, on, on that, those developments as well. Um, so um, uh, changing gears a bit, I want to uh, touch base um, with you, Reiner, um, uh, about um, you mentioned, uh, again, chip safety, security, reliability. Um, you know, obviously, the, the biggest markets currently these days are uh, in the ones that, um, you know, use some of the other memory, such as um, PC and c communication with autos and industrial about, you know, 10, 10% on average in terms of end use. Um, but they're growing. Uh, and, uh, and there are other markets, I'm sure, that are growing um, that will probably rely on these types of traits, right, uh, um, that will need all the things that you talked about. Can you explain or give us an idea of when you look out five years or 10 years and Finian and planning and, and what do you what do you see is like oh here's some other markets that we see is growing that will need what we have yeah so i mean today a lot of course is discussion about automotive uh, automotive is growing rapidly we have um a v-shaped recovery which is actually overwhelming a little bit the supply chain at the moment as you see in the news <laughs> yeah um, but also um we see that long-term trend coming uh the the content per car is is going up with a very nice growth rate everything which has to do with safety is growing um, in the high teens for us um, the electrification drives a lot of power semiconductors in the other areas but also it drives more powertrain controllers which need additional uh, reliable nor flash uh, to to work with these high-end real-time processes driving your car especially when you have a hybrid car or a full electric car um, coming to the other areas, I think the key one is the mega trend of everything is getting smarter and everything is getting connected. And we, we basically benefit on both ends. We benefit on the one side with the rollout of 5G. Uh, 5G radios need much more NOR than 4G LTE. And the number of nodes is going up drastically in 5G because mm -hmm. the, the reach is shorter um, in physical distance you can get to yourself. So this is very nice. But the, the other big one, and that's frankly a little bit the, the unknown, the, the edge devices get more smart. They need more external memory to store the code. It's not purely in the, in the host controller anymore, or they are so advanced that there is no embedded technology available anymore. Mm -hmm. And that is sometimes hard to see. We see it, of course, in the industrial world. We see it in the power world. But just one example we had recently, we got a big upside request from a European customer who said, well, I need your products. Give me extra millions of units because I have to build the sensors, the modules which are put into the boxes with a COVID vaccine. And then wow. we're controlling the cool chain. Again, harsh environment. We need to control everything. We need to know what is the status. We need to make it wireless connected. And that's where suddenly a NOR is, is spiking up in demand. So these are just some examples. It's sometimes hard to tell where exactly the application is coming from. There are so many people with great ideas yeah. uh, when it comes to connected devices. But the, the variety of technologies combined with that, you can trust them in, in dependability, is giving us these spikes, um, sometimes driven by effects like the COVID vaccine rollout. Yeah, no, I love that example. That's that's so um, that that's so real world, you know, for people can can really uh, can uh, can can relate to that. Uh, it reminds me too, you know, um, you know, uh, we think talking about NAND I, a long time ago. I remember researching that uh, NAND had been around uh, since the '80s, right? And um, was in, I think invented by uh, someone in Toshiba, and it really wasn't until years later when you know people needed a mobile application, right? That NAND became you know super hot and became uh, commercially um, you know you know took off, right? Um, in that similar light, and we, and we have just a couple more questions. I want to um, talk uh, ask you, Tom. You know a lot of the stuff that uh, you're working on, you know, emerging now. Um, uh, but you know, just like NAND, you know, decades ago, given a, a certain need in the market, could you know could take off, right? Um, can you give us a, uh, I know we got a couple other questions about other types of um, uh, memory technologies, NRAM. Um, I know you folks are focused on MRAM, M -M um, but um, what other types of, if you could, just in, in a minute or two, what other types of you know, emerging technologies are out there that, that, that you want to put on people's radar in terms of uh, what, what is being developed? 
Well, what about that, that theme I was trying to play on earlier about how you really have to keep up with technologies. You can't assume what you've seen in the past is, is the same thing that you're using to, to today, that there's some major innovations. Uh, certainly MRAM is one of those, but also I'd say FERAM. FERAM has made some major breakthroughs with the hafnium oxide. They're doing some very interesting work there where you could have a FinFET that would actually hmm. it would be a storage element by itself. That, it was sort of a, it was kind of in the toggle regime that it was sort of capped out at its first uh, initial structure. And so that's one I'm really keeping my eye on. And then of course, with the new architectures that you see coming along uh, for like analog computing, stochastic computing, you know, that those are places that these continuous uh, res uh, resistive devices and things actually have a really interesting play in terms of how they're gonna integrate with these other emerging technologies. So it's gonna be really interesting. So it, it's, it's just across the spectrum, like I was trying to show, we see demand, as Rainer was pointing out, for a lack of embedded technology in the advanced, embedded memory of the advanced nodes. This is a place that's a fertile territory that could have a major impact. Uh, then all the way to the IoT type devices, uh, you know, working in space is about as AI at the edge as you can get. Yes. And so there's a lot of uh, a real opportunity there too because of the various temperature regimes. Yeah, well, I get I get the feeling. Um, I know our time is up, but I, I get the feeling. Um, you know, memory uh, is going to be around for quite a long time. New types of memory, and it's always going to be an interesting topic. So uh, perhaps we'll have to touch base again in a year and find out where we are in terms of uh, what's going on. Um, but want to um, again thank you all uh, for taking the time uh, to speak with us. Uh, we are at the top of the hour, so um, uh, uh, let me just say, uh, Craig Stice of Omdia, uh, uh, Dr. Reiner. Huller of uh, Infineon Technologies and Dr. Uh, Thomas Boone of Spin Memory. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us and we look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye-bye.